Welcome to episode 16 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm going to be interviewing Franklin Leonard. He's a former development executive and now runs the Blacklist website, which is a place for screenwriters to get exposure for their scripts. I've been using the site a little bit myself, and in this episode, I dig in with Franklin about some of the real specifics on how you can use this site to promote your work. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and leave a comment. I want to improve this podcast, so some honest, constructive feedback is very much appreciated. Please also share these podcast episodes with anyone who you think could get some value out of them. As always, I do read every comment that I get and respond where appropriate. I want to thank a few people who posted comments over at YouTube this past week. Thank you, Diane Greenlay, Stamford Crane, Maria Karasako, Richard Hector, and Constance Nunn. Also, I just added the Lego Movie Screenplay to the Selling Your Screenplay library, so check that out if you get a chance. It was sent in by my friend Adam Strange. Please do, if you find any um, screenplays that you own that you um, don't see on the um, Selling Your Screenplay library, please email them to me so I can add them to the library. A couple of quick notes, any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. I'm going to try and increase my podcasting production to once per week or at least four times per month. It seems to be bringing in a lot of traffic to the blog, so we'll see if I'm able to keep that pace up. I got a couple of general questions about listening to podcasts this past week, so I thought I'd just run through a few things. I got an email from a screenwriter about how busy she was trying to work her real job right and then also learn about screenwriting by listening to podcasts and reading screenwriting blogs. One thing to keep in mind, especially if you're early in your screenwriting journey, writing is the most important part of becoming a screenwriter, and reading scripts is the second most important part. So if you're short on time, by all means, don't worry about listening to this or any other podcasts. The writing should always come first. I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I always do it when I can't do anything else. I download them to my phone, and then I listen to them while working or while walking or while or when I'm waiting in the dentist's office or someplace or just waiting in line someplace. Basically, any dead time I have, I just cue them up on my phone and then I listen to them so that I can turn that dead time into somewhat productive time. Also, most cars these days have radios with that are Bluetooth enabled, so you can pair your phone with the radio and then listen through your car speakers when you're driving. Driving is when I actually listen to the most podcasts. Um, I have, as again, I have a bunch queued up on my phone, and I just listen to them whenever I'm driving in the phone. Any time that I have where I can physically be sitting at my desk and doing real work. I am not listening to podcasts. I'm actually trying to get stuff done. So that's really my advice. And and if you didn't know about some of that, um, as far as pairing your, your phone with your radio and your car and that kind of stuff, definitely check that out because it makes listening to podcasts much more enjoyable. I mean, instead of listening to the radio or something like that, you can queue up some actually interesting content. A few quick words about what I'm working on. As I up these podcasts to once per week, I'm not sure if I'm really going to be able to keep talking about what I'm working on as not much has changed since last week when I did the last podcast. So I might start skipping this section some weeks if nothing major has taken place, but I will keep updating with any major changes, anything, um, you know, really exciting or if I'm doing anything um, special in, in a given week or even a given couple of weeks, I will update what I'm working on. But I don't think I'm going to keep this section up if I continue to put out podcasts once per week. So now let's get into the main segment. 
As I mentioned at the top of this podcast, I interview um, Franklin Leonard from the Blacklist website. Here is the interview. Welcome, Franklin, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Sure. So to start out, I wonder if you can just give us a quick overview of your career in the entertainment industry, um, how you got started and kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I, um, so I've been working in the entertainment industry for just over 11 years now. Um, literally, I think my one year anniversary of arriving or my 11 year anniversary of arriving in Los Angeles was last week. Um, but, um, you know, I came out here, I've been working as a management consultant at McKinsey and Company. Um, I've been laid off with five months severance, uh, along with the rest of my analyst class. And, um, you know, I'd always loved movies, but it never occurred to me that, you know, there were jobs for people with my background in the industry. So I came out here in March of 2003 um, with a round trip ticket leaving at the beginning of April. And I happened to uh, meet a friend of a friend who told me that there was an agent at CAA looking for an assistant. Uh, I sent my resume in, interviewed the next day, was offered the job the day following, and uh, started that next Monday. Um, I had to fly back to New York to like pack up my life and, and move to Los Angeles, but um, I started officially at CAA in April of 2003. Uh, I was there as an assistant for a year in the motion picture lit department, and then I got a job as a creative executive at John Goldwyn's production company just after he left uh, running Paramount. I uh, was there for about eight months before going to Leonardo DiCaprio's company. Uh was there for about two and a half years, uh, which was where I started the blacklist. Um, and then I went to work for Sidney Pollock and Anthony Minghella at Mirage Enterprises. Um, shortly after I started working there, Sidney was diagnosed with cancer. Shortly after that, Anthony died. And shortly after that, Sidney passed as well. Um, it still remains one of the high points of my professional career, though. Besides being extraordinary filmmakers, they were both extraordinary gentlemen, um, and, and I consider myself very lucky to have had them as, as both employers and also as uh, examples of how one could carry yourself within the industry and still be successful. Um, after they passed, I went on to Universal Pictures as a director of development. I was there for two years before uh, getting offered a job at Will Smith's company, Overbrook Entertainment, where I was for two years. And in uh, September of 2012, uh, I left Overbrook and decided to focus full time on the blacklist and have been doing that ever since. Great, great. So um, these different jobs with Leonardo DiCaprio companies, they were all development jobs. You were getting material yeah. in and helping to package it, helping to helping yeah, the writers to job, develop it. I was a development executive working, you know, starting with the John Golden job all the way through Overbrook. Um, you know, my job was, I like to call it consuming the world, identifying the things that are worthy of being passed up the chain of command. And, and when you're when the chain of command agrees with you that they are worthy, doing everything you can to try to get them made. Mm -hmm. So wh when you started the blacklist, what was your sort of idea? Like, I mean, did you have any idea it would sort of turn into what it's turned into or what was your idea just starting it? Yeah, God, no, no. It was really um, I was just looking for a good script, some good scripts to read over the holidays. And I probably defaulted to the sort of management consulting thinking uh, in order to solve that problem, because I've gone months without reading anything that I thought was worthy of sort of walking into my boss's office at Appian and slapping the script down on the desk and saying, you'll thank me in the morning. Um, and that was my job. So I was either doing my job very poorly or the job was reading terrible scripts and passing on it, in which case, uh, you know, law school probably would have been a better option. And I should have listened <laughs> to my mother's weekly phone calls asking me if my LSAT scores were still valid. But um but no, I literally just sent an email to 75 of my peers. Um, literally, I think it was everyone that I had had breakfast, lunch, dinner, or drinks with in 2003, excuse me, 2005, and um, asked them to send me a list of their 10 favorite scripts from that year. And in exchange, I would send them the aggregated list. And, and I slapped a vaguely subversive name on it, sent it back out, and went on vacation and really didn't think anything else of it. And when I came back from vacation, it had been forwarded back to me several dozen times. And, you know, I think it became something of an institutional arbiter of material relatively quickly. And it was never my plan for it to become that. And truthfully, over the last decade, um, it really has just been about making the next right decision so that the uh, so that what it is could be preserved and continue to be a tide that raises all boats. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, as a, as a development executive, on like just as an example, that first list, how many of those scripts had you not already read? Because that's always one of the things. It seems like the scripts on there are scripts that most of us sort of know that are, are sort of out there and are pretty um, – so how many new scripts were you able to say, oh, I haven't read that one and that one? I, don't, I think I had read maybe a half of okay. this, the, maybe the top 100 scripts that were on that first list. You know, each year that passed while I was still working as a development executive, I would use that as a uh, 
an indication of, of how well I had done my job during the year is how many of the scripts that ended up in the top 20 that I had read prior to the list coming out. And that, you know, I considered myself very good at my job and I read obviously quite a bit um, just as by virtue of the fact that I became the blacklist guy that people would send me material that they may not have sent wide. Um, but I, I, mean, I was familiar with probably 75% of, of the scripts that were on the list. But I think that, look, I... Um, I don't believe for a moment that every script on the list is something that everyone is already aware of or that most people are already aware of, unless you are doing aggressive tracking of the market for material throughout the year. Um, and I think further, um, the scripts that are on the list, even if they're scripts that people are already aware of, um, they may have passed for a myriad of reasons prior to the list coming out. And I think the list you know, shines a very bright spotlight on material that is often on its face not very commercial and forces people to take a second look, particularly people very senior in the industry that aren't necessarily tracking the spec market or tracking the sample market. They're actually focused on getting movies made or running the movies that are already being made, but they may, you know, go back and look at a script that maybe they had heard about um, or that their assistant had given them um, with a, a, a great deal more seriousness than they would had it script not been on the list. Mm -hmm. Did it do what you wanted it to do? Like, did it f help you find some new scripts that that you yeah. didn't and and get them into production and stuff? Um, well, not not production necessarily, but it definitely got me. It, it put me. It, it, a, it made me aware of writers that I hadn't been aware of, writers that I was very excited to work with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember um, hiring Josh Zedimer, um, who was on the second list with a script called Villain. Um, who was a very young writer at the time. He didn't have any credits and was duly represented. But I, we, we at Appian hired him to write a script called Infiltrator that ended up being the number four script on the next year's blacklist, um, which is actually, I think, a still available script that's quite strong. But he was competing against writers that had far more experience and far more produced credits than he did. But by virtue of the fact that, you know, he came in and gave a great pitch and that I had read his script from the previous list, which I hadn't read prior to the list coming out, um, we ended up hiring him, and, and he did a very good job on that that first assignment. Okay, great. So then, how did this sort of morph into what we have today as the um, the blacklist website, where new writers can upload their scripts? Yeah, I think there's sort of two uh, uh, there were two sort of forces that were working in concert that sort of led me to that to to build that out. Um, you know, the, when the first list went out in 2005, the notion of internet virality was still relatively new. Um, you know, the, the blacklist went viral the same in Hollywood the same weekend that the Saturday Night, Li Saturday Night Live Lazy Sunday uh, music video went, uh, went viral, which was, um, you know, still it was phenomenal how quickly it sort of made its rounds around the web and people were fascinated by it. But by 2010, the notion of a once yearly PDF that circulated via email had become sort of adorable. Um, and I knew there was potential with technology to expand upon our, our initial mission. Um, and then once we launched the beta for that site, which sort of functioned as a real-time blacklist that allowed industry professionals to rate the scripts, those ratings would aggregate to create a best of list. Um, and we built a recommendations algorithm with some guidance from people who'd won the Netflix prize. Um, so once we built that, we realized that there was a, there was a, that we could use that platform to answer another question that had been a preoccupation of mine. And that was, you know, whenever I went to, to go speak at panels or do interviews like this as the blacklist guy, invariably the first question that I was asked was, you know, it's great that you've created this thing that helps writers who are already represented get the attention that they deserve, especially when they're brand new to the industry. But I wrote what I think is a pretty good script, but I don't, you know, my dad doesn't work in the industry. I didn't go to college uh, with people who work in the industry now, or I didn't go to college at all. Um, and typically the answers to those questions, you know, it's like, what do I do with, to get my script to the industry? And typically the answers to those questions were one of two things. It was submit to the Nichols Fellowship, which is, you know, hands down the sort of most important screenwriting competition on earth um, run by the Academy. And if you're in the top 30, someone will probably call you. Or the answer was, well, you know, move to Los Angeles and network your brains out and eventually someone will read your script. And if it's good, you'll have an opportunity. And I was I was sort of unsatisfied with those answers. Um, you know, the Nichols Fellowship is great, and I have extraordinary admiration for it, um, and, and in particular for Greg Beale, who has run it, you know, incredibly well for 30 years. Um, but this idea of that, that anyone can just pick up their life and move to Los Angeles and network in order to get a job, and that that is somehow an indication of, of their talent as a writer, I find, frankly, insulting. Um, you know, if you have a family and you have a job and you have, you know, financial responsibilities, picking up your life and moving to Los Angeles 
is is irresponsible. Um, and I just don't believe that it should be necessary. And I also don't believe that a person's networking skill has anything to do or is in any way correlated with their ability as a writer. And in fact, I think that there's a good chance that it might be inversely correlated. So what we wanted to do was build an opportunity for people to submit their material to the industry without having to jump through the hoops that have nothing to do with their ability as a writer. And uh, we realized that we could sort of throw the gate open a little bit wider on the site that we had already created, charge a fee um, that would allow us to sustain it as a, as a business, um, and we could, you know, very efficiently allow people to have their material submitted to the industry, have it evaluated by people who have experience with the current marketplace. And if their work is good, we can get it to literally thousands of film and television industry professionals. And um, so we launched that in mid-October of 2012, and thus far it's gone pretty well. Mm -hmm. So is there some way of distinguishing between, like, the, the original blacklist and then this new service, the blacklist? Is there some terminology you guys use even internally that sort of distinguishes yeah. them? We talk about the we talk about the the annual list as the annual blacklist, and that okay. the blacklist is the site. You know, I'll admit that there's some brand confusion. Um, you know, I'm very attached to the name, the blacklist, the source of it. You know, when, when I originally created the list in 2005, I had no expectation or no idea that it would become what it's become. Um, but it was it was named that because you know I'm politically pretty progressive, and uh, I wanted to to make a reference to the writers many of them extraordinary writers whose careers were ended because of their political beliefs. Um, but I also am a black kid who grew up in West Central Georgia, and I remember being in English class and being told that, you know, if you see white in, in literature, that's sort of good and pure, um, and if the, you know, the cowboy's wearing the white hat, they're probably the hero, and black is the opposite of that, and if you're the cowboy's wearing a black hat, they're probably the villain. You know, and you, as you can imagine, as an 11-year-old black kid, um, I didn't like where that was going. Sure. And, um, and I, uh, I remember thinking, you know, one day I'm going to write a novel that sort of, you know, inverts that. And I've never done that, um, nor probably will I ever. But I definitely look for opportunities to invert um, those, those color-based assumptions whenever possible. And um, so the initial list was called The Blacklist. Um, it became something of a brand. When we launched the website, uh, we sort of escalated the, the brand name to represent the entire organization, the, the list that is voted on by executives at the end of the year is the annual list, and the website is just simply the blacklist or the blacklist website. Um, you know, if, if writers say they had a script on the, black, the blacklist, um, it definitely behooves you to ask what they're referring to. Uh, typically, though, I think the past tense, as in I had a script on the blacklist, usually refers to scripts that were on the annual list, and I have a script on the blacklist uh, refers to people with something on the website. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so um, let's dig in. As I mentioned to you in the pre-interview, I'm a writer, and I'm actually using the site. So I just, you know, have a bunch of real um, nitty-gritty nuts and bolts type questions. First, let's just start out. Um, how many agents, managers, and producers do you have? And do you have, like, a percentage of, of each one, even yeah, if it's just I ballpark? Have, I don't have an employment breakdown, unfortunately. We currently have over 2,300 industry professional members that range from agency assistants all the way up to studio and network presidents. So, but you don't know if it's predominantly agents, predominantly producers, more. Um, I think it's. I think it, it ranges pretty widely. I don't. I actually don't know what the uh, the breakdown is at all. Has um, has there been any crossover yet from someone who submitted the script, you know, to the site and then it made it onto the annual blacklist list? Yeah, there were five writers um, on this year's annual list who okay. found their representation via the site um, in the previous year. Uh, Justin Kramer who wrote uh, McCarthy, who was on, um, he was on both the 2012 and the 2013 list with different scripts. Um, Richard Cordner, who wrote The Shark Is Not Working, um, who now has a two script line deal at Warner Brothers, who was discovered by Warner Brothers via the site. Um, Zach Frankel, uh, Make a Wish, Declan O'Dwyer, uh, Broken Cove. I think those are the ones that made the list this year. There may be one that I'm forgetting, but no, there have been quite a few. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so okay, so here's just kind of getting into some of the um, actual um, nuts yep. and bolts. When I, when, as a writer, when I log in and I'm looking at other people's scripts, there are there's a chart of a rating distribution lines. One line is yep. orange and it's labeled uploaded scripts. The other line is gray and called non-uploaded scripts. Are the non-uploaded scripts those are the what are the non-uploaded and what are the uploaded? Yeah, so, you know, every member of the Writers Guild East and Writers Guild West, and as of today, actually, the Writers Guild of Great Britain is able to list their uh, their screenplays on the site free of charge. 
Uh, um, so, you know, in addition to being a site that allows writers to upload their material and get it to people in the industry, you know, we also sort of function as Google for screenplays within the industry. So we have a listing of literally thousands of other scripts that have circulated throughout the industry over the last decade. Um, and those those scripts are rated by industry professionals just the same as, uh, you know, aspiring professional screenwriter scripts are rated. So um, the non-uploaded scripts are scripts that are listed in our database but are not hosted in our database. Um, and, and as you might expect, the rate that that distribution is, is shifted probably about two points ahead up uh, from the, the, the um, distribution of the uploaded scripts, which I think accurately reflects the fact that folks that are working professional writers are writing at a higher level on average than, than those that aren't. So when you say they're not hosted, they're, they're in the database but not hosted, does that mean they, they, like when you go to some, when I'm looking at scripts at the bottom, it lists a bunch of other scripts that I might like. Uh, do those WGA scripts, are they potentially in that list? Like can someone click through and find them? Yeah, they can click through and find information about the script, but not the script itself. So they would find I the script example, is not hosted. I see the script is not hosted, but it's, a, it's a, there's a listing under the database in the same way that that you, you might list your script just without the actual file attached. And I the difference see. is that most of those folks are represented. So when it's listed, you know, they're, they're, you've got the title and the author and the log line, but then you also have the representation information or the, whether there's a producer attached. And if I'm an industry professional and I see that, you know, so-and-so has written a script that I'm interested in getting a copy of, I see that it's represented at an agency. I can then call that agent and say, hey, this script sounded interesting. I'd like to know more about it. Okay, I see. I understand. Okay, so um, – Again, I'm looking at these um, distribution charts, and it looked like 23.7% equals a 5. The 17.89 was a 4, and I just basically added that up. So am I right in thinking that the, the basically the, 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 the ratings of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 equaled 56% looking at that distribution chart? So is that basically what that means, that 56% of all the ratings are a 5 and below, and then 44% are a – you know, I guess I'd be above a so six and above. Yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, ultimately, it's a simple histogram, just reflecting you know all of the ratings that, and the, the distribution of all the ratings that have been sort of made thus far. Yeah. Okay, and, and and that was my other question. Is it is that a? It's not just the scripts that are currently hosted or in your database. It's like if I pull my script off, does that remove it from those percentages? No, yeah, that's a great question. No, that 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 reflects all ratings that have been made for every single like uh, uploaded script over the course of the life of the site. I see, I see. Okay, because that's what I was thinking. Is it seems like obviously you've if you get a bad rating, you're probably going to pull it down. So those those ratings would constantly shift. Um, okay, so let's talk about. You have a section called the top list, and. Um, can you tell me is I mean, I'm reading the the section. It says um, exceeding the community average of five point six nine. Now, uh, again, what I just did that added up, that seems like fifty six percent or about a five. So is it are you telling me that roughly fifty percent of the scripts are, you know, maybe forty five percent or something are making the top list? What percent get on that top list? Um. It's actually a relatively low percentage. It's much lower than, than what you're expecting. Because, like, again, in order to get on the top list, you have to have at least two ratings. Um, and those, the average of those ratings needs to be above the, the, the community average for scripts currently hosted. So, you know, I think you rightly identified, for example, that um, the average of all evaluations, or all ratings made over the life of the site is below 56 the current average for all of all ratings for scripts that are currently hosted on the site is, I believe, 5.66, what you said. Um, and so any script that is on that top list uh, or anywhere on the top list would need to have an average rating through two or more ratings, at least for the month top list. For the quarter top list, I think it's three ratings, and I want to say for the yearly top list, it's five. Um, you need to have an average rating higher than, than 5.66. Um, if I had to guess as to the number, uh, the percentage, it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten percent. Okay, and so, but um, taking a step back, so of the, um, you're you're talking about like the last month. There's some time constraints. So like scripts, yeah. if they've had two ratings, and let's just say they get an average of seven, so that's above that benchmark of five point six, it will stay on the yeah. top list for a month, and then if it doesn't get any more ratings, it will fall off the top list. It's a little more dynamic than that. So, you know, you'll notice on the site you can sort of determine like which top list you want to see. So if you want to see the, the top uploaded list month to date, quarter to date, year to date, 
it's just it's going to generate the list of the top scripts based on ratings made over the previous month. Um, so yes, if you've had two sevens in the previous month, um, you will definitely be included somewhere in that list. So one one thought that occurred to me just as a user was. Um, I upload the script and I get I buy one rating and if the first rating is really bad then there's not a lot of point to buying a second rating but you're saying there's some to get in this top list um, there's some like time constraints so you've got to get those two ratings within like a certain amount of time period like maybe a month or something is that correct well, you see what I'm getting at though no I, I do I don't I, I think it's again I, I, I want to encourage you to look at the the, the top list as sort of just dynamic charts of um, the, the the sort of the, the most highly rated scripts over the previous month. Now, if as a writer you want to make sure that you end up in the top list for the previous month, then yes, it would it would it would be necessary to have two ratings in that first month. But I don't think that it's um, look I, I, I'm I never want to suggest to people that they give us money. So I, I want to clarify I want to sort of preface my statements with that. Um, but I do want to explain what the potential advantages are to buying an additional uh, evaluation if, for example, you get a low rating on your first evaluation. The first element of that is that, you know, storytelling and the evaluation of storytelling is subjective. We're talking about an art form. Um, and so there are going to be some, some things that people love and that people hate. If, for example, you your first evaluation is a five, but you believe that it's quite good, and um, you can then get another evaluation, and it's possible that your next evaluation is going to be an eight. And I reference eight specifically because if you get an eight, um, once a week, every Monday, we send out an email to all of our industry members saying, here's a list of the scripts that our readers read over the previous week that got a score of eight or better overall. Um, so it's not just like att getting garnering attention on the site is not just about being in the top lists. Um, there are myriad ways in which we draw attention to people's material on the site. One is the top list. One is these uh, weekly emails, you know, highlighting all the scripts that got eight overall or better. Another is our recommendations algorithm um, that allows us to make recommendations to individual uh, users based on their individual taste alongside the taste of everyone else on the site. Um, and we also send out an email, and the, the recommendations emails go out on Friday, though there's always a dynamic recommendations uh, being made throughout the site. Um, and then there's also an email that goes out every Wednesday um, that is targeted based on each individual member's preferences. So if I'm a comedy producer um, and I'm interested in comedies that have very strong dialogue, I get an email every Wednesday that, that lists for me every comedy that got at least an eight or better on dialogue um, by the Blacklist uh, readers in the previous seven days. I see. Um, and it kind of... Um one of the things I noticed, I mean, one of the things is you have like a download chart for the top list, how many downloads, um, and I think that's very helpful, and I was wondering, is there any kind of a chart for like, okay, this is how many downloads from the top list, and then this is how many downloads from the site in general, because that's, that's the real, like, that, you see where I'm going with this is, if you don't get an A or you don't get into the top list, is it worth to keep your script up there? Um, yeah. You know, I think this this is why we provide sort of complete transparency about the volume of traffic to your script. Um, you know, and I've said it I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If we're not getting you track you know traction on your material, then you should not give us your money. You should take your script down. Um, you know, we we published sort of regular data dumps. The most recent big one was in uh, late August, uh, late October of last year. Um, sort of trying to give people some guidance around the the traffic on the site. So, for example, there's a chart on our annual report, which you can view um, directly via our homepage, um, that shows the number, the average number of downloads depending on what your highest overall rating is. And if I remember the numbers correctly, if your highest rating is a six, you know, on average, uh, or the average number of downloads for scripts whose highest rating was six was 2.55. For seven, I want to say it was 4.55. For eight, I think it jumps to like 15. Um, and then nine, it goes even higher. But, um, you know, we're, it's, it's, I'll take that note under advisement. It's an interesting suggestion. Um, I'm not sure how much a global view of site activity um, would help guide each individual writer 
um, in terms of giving a sense of whether their script's getting traction. Um, we thought the best way to do that would be to provide absolute transparency on the volume of traffic to your page, um, and then also give you a sense of what the sort of the top scripts are getting, um, and you can sort of base your decision on whether to continue to keep your script hosted based on that. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, I, I, I've had I have four scripts up there. One of them is kind of a little. I've just bought a rating for it, so it's kind of new. But the um, the other three and mine are, are fringe. I mean, um, as I said, my, my, I have one that's got two ratings, a five and a six, so it's got a 5.5. So that one, as I said, I think it was up for a month or two and it didn't get any downloads. And that's why I, I, I don't know if I should keep it up. And that's kind of why I'm asking the question. If I, if I saw some overall stats saying, well, like what you just said, well, you get two downloads if your highest rating is six. And this one has a six. Well, that's, so, that's on, so that's on, that's on average though. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, no, that, certainly. You know, that, are, that have high, that have higher concept log lines that are probably getting more, but the vast majority of them are probably not getting any. Um, yeah. And again, I think that's it, it's not for me to say one way or the other, but I think the reality is that you know industry professionals are looking for the best material, and I'm not saying that your script is not that, but I think within our ecosystem, you know, a 5.5 is slightly better than average. It actually is a little bit below average for the scripts that are currently hosted on the site. And as a consequence, I think, there, you know, given the choice between a script with a 5 and a 6 and a script with an 8 and a 9, they're always going to download the 8 and 9. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I mean, I mean, not always. Like, it depends on the log line and what they're looking for. But they're, they're far likelier to download the script with the 8 and 9 than the 5 and 6. Obviously, yeah. Well, I, yeah, and then it might have to do with the log line or the genre or something along yeah. those lines. Um, so... Um, the the one thing that I think is was a little bit uh, ironic was the one download that I had on my script was actually before it got any ratings. And that kind of leads me to my next question. Is there um, a lot of purpose to having a script up there and not purchasing the ratings? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, we we gave people, you know, when we launched, the, I went back and forth on this. You know, there was there was some. There was a part of me that wanted to say, if you upload a script, you're required to purchase evaluations because it makes it easier for us to know if your script is good and then make recommendations. But ultimately, we decided to not require anything because we would wanted to provide as much flexibility as possible for the writer using our site. And I think that there are, and we're starting to see people get traction for their material without buying an evaluation necessarily. And one of the ways people do that is, is query using the link. Um, you know, they, they, they network and say, hey, my script is hosted on the site. If you want to download it, you can go here and download it. Um, you know, I strongly advise buying an evaluation, uh, not because it's necessary, but because if, it, if your script is evaluated very positively, the process can happen very quickly. You know, if you pay for an evaluation and your evaluation comes back as an eight or better overall, or even having some eight component scores, you know, you're going to go, you're going to be included in that Monday email and people are going to pay attention. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, you're, you're less likely to get traffic unless you're doing something else to draw traffic to your script. Um, but for the most part, uh, you, you want, you know, people are on our site not to look for any script or a script with a certain log line. They're looking for the like really good material. And unless you can provide an indication that it is really good material, um, you're less likely to find real traffic. And the reason we have the evaluations is so that you can establish, yes, my script is good. Mm hmm. So um, and this is I, I think I already know the answer to this question, but I wrote it down because I was a little unclear at the time. There's on each script, there's reviews and there's ratings. Um, the the ratings like for every purchase, when you purchase a review, they give you a rating and a review. But the, the producers and agents, they can correct me if I'm wrong. They can only give you a rating. Correct. They can't give you a review. Yeah, that's correct. OK, OK. Um, you just charge my computer. Sorry. Hang on a second. Yep. Realized that I was not plugged in. Okay. Um, so there's no way to see who is, um, and I'll get to this a little bit um, later on, but I did exactly what you just suggested, was I just did a query blast, and I included for my most recent script, and I did get six downloads. Um, is there a way of seeing who is downloaded Um the script like it says professional download but i i don't see a way to actually tell what company that was that downloaded it no there's not okay um, know, this was a say we, that, keep, we keep very extensive records of that but you know we, we know we don't we don't make that information available 
Okay. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not concerned with someone stealing my script or anything like that. But as I said, what I did was a query blast and, yeah. and a bunch of people, the day I did the blast, a bunch of people downloaded the script. And so I would like to follow up with those people. And, um, and I can't tell who they are because I sent the query letter yeah. to so many people. Well, so I can't that, tell who they are. Exactly, that's exactly why we don't uh, provide the information because we don't want writers to be following up in an inappropriate way. Um, not that you would do it inappropriately, but a lot of writers do. And um, we wanted to provide a, a safe space where uh, industry professionals could download material and if they did like it, reach out to the writer, but not put themselves in a situation where they were equally likely, if not more likely, to then be harassed by writers uh, following up. Um, I know in my case, when I was an executive, I, would have, I was less likely to read material if there was the possibility of follow up um, than I would be if I could read it and if I loved it, know that I could do something with it, but not have to worry about it if I didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is actually it's a suggestion I made to the ink, t- ink tip folks at one point, and it fell on deaf ears. But I think this would be very valuable. Is um, and I didn't see it. Maybe it's on the site. But um, you know, I would be curious to see more genre. And maybe you said this big data dump. Maybe it was included in that. But I would be curious to see like um, j- number of downloads by genre and dig into some of those stats. I would also be curious when I click through on specific people's scripts. Again, maybe the writer would have to agree to let this happen. But I would like to see the number of downloads that certain scripts were getting just so I could see with my own eyes what producers and agents and managers are, are kind of looking for. And I mean, I, I did yesterday or a couple of days ago, I did one where you request to read a script and the writer requested it. So it seems like it, that could add a lot of value and just give um, writers additional value for being a part of the site. They can read other writers' scripts that are getting good reviews. They can see what's being downloaded, see what genres are, are most popular, that kind of stuff. Yeah, we did a we did a pretty uh, deep uh, genre analysis about five months into the life of the site. If you go to blacklist.com forward slash uh, month five, month five being spelled out M O N T H F I V E, um, you'll see a, I mean, a really I sort of nerded out on this one, um, but uh, both genre and subgenre, uh, how often the scripts were being downloaded. Um, what we would have expected the volume to be based on the number of scripts that were submitted and which uh, genres were over-indexing and under-indexing. There's also a little bit of further information along those lines uh, on our annual report, again, uh, directly linked from their homepage. Um, As far as uh, letting writers see the number of downloads from their fellow writers, it's definitely something that we'd be open to. We hadn't really explored it. We do allow, for example, right now, writers to make visible their ratings, but only if they so choose. Um, You know, we have an explicit do no harm policy, so all writers are able to control what information, if any, they make available to any part of the community. Um, Yeah, sure, that's great. But but the volume of downloads is definitely something that I feel like we could give them the option to make public. Um, But but again, you know, we already, and we launched this a couple of months ago, uh, the ability for writers to download their fellow writers' scripts um, or to do so with permission um, you know, has been has been around for a few months, and we've actually I think we've seen over 2,000 downloads of script by writers of their fellow writers' material. The thing that's been most surprising to me is the fact that I think over 75% of the scripts that are hosted on the site are available for download by you know writers by other writers. Um, I, I've been really surprised and impressed by the extent to which people do want to share their work with folks who aren't even industry professionals. Yeah, yeah. No, I've downloaded a couple and, and started to take a look at those. So I think that is, that's excellent. I mean, I want to commend you too. I have some background in web development and I mean, the user interface you guys have put together is excellent. It's a really polished, nice site. So you've done Thank a great you. job. Yeah. Just I, I, I deserve literally no credit for that at all. That All that credit comes <laughs> okay. from my partner, Dean um, who is an, an ace uh, sort of programmer and designer. And I'm very lucky to be partnered with him in this venture. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and frankly, over the last year, uh, Terry Wong, um, who works with us now um, ha- has contributed greatly, I think, also to the evolution of the design, and and we we, we have a lot of th- exciting things coming in in that regard as well. So, perfect. So, um, another question that I kind of was wondering: Can you give us any insight into how the visibility algorithm works? I mean, you have two sections when you're at least from a writer perspective. When I'm looking at someone's scripts, you have related scripts, and you have if you like the script, you'll also like these. Um, obviously, as a writer, I haven't rated any scripts, so I'm just curious how you decide: Is it by genre? Is it uh, similarly rated scripts? How yeah, do you determine what scripts similar, to show us? Similar scripts is definitely a sort of genre tag. Uh, sometimes representation issue. 
um, and that's how the algorithm determines similar scripts. Um, if you like these scripts, you may also like these scripts as a bit of an inversion of our recommendations algorithm. Um, and we use the ratings uh, from industry professionals to basically say, um, and our and our readers to essentially say, um, you know, someone who really likes this script based on the ratings, what are the other scripts that they also really like? Um, and essentially what the algorithm does is that it looks at groups of people who love one script or one person who loves the script, and then it looks at other scripts that they rated highly and tries to make a predictive uh, a prediction about what the, what rating this other person will rate it um, or this sort of fabricated person will rate it, and, um, and then sort of list the top ones for each script as sort of if you like this, you might like this. It functions very similar to Amazon or Netflix or any, any, one of those, any one of those other recommendations algorithms. It's just looking at the coincidence between people who like this and people who like other things. I see. Um, let's talk just a second about the featured script. Um, I get an email, yeah. well, I guess it's every week or two weeks, um, two with weeks. the script every two weeks. And how do you choose those scripts that get featured? Yeah. Typically, those scripts are scripts that are either that have gotten consistently high ratings, both from our readers um, or from our um, our industry professionals, um, but maybe they haven't gone anywhere for whatever reason, or they're scripts that have unusually divergent ratings. Um, they're scripts that are beloved or quite hated, um, and we want to foreground things that are a little more divisive and a little more polarizing, um, because if someone loves it, that's an indication that someone else might. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that just kind of occurred to me was um, going back to something you said earlier. You mentioned that, um, as I said, if a script gets a bad rating, let's just say they get a four or a five, and then they do another rating and they get an eight, because they have one rating or eight, or let's just say they got five ratings of a five, and then they finally get a rating of an eight, would you include that in this weekly email to the professionals because they hit that one eight, or is there some sort of weighted average with yeah, the other so bad ratings? I'm one overall eight gets you included in that email. That email is literally just as simple as here's all the scripts that got an eight or above uh, from at least one reader over the previous week. Um, you know, and, and one other thing I should mention is, is that if you get two successive uh, evaluations and they differ by three or more uh, points, so if you got a five and then you get an eight, we offer you a third evaluation at cost, which is $25, so literally 50% off of what you initially paid for those evaluations, you can get a third evaluation. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, scripts that are highly divergent, um, we want to be able to make better recommendations to the people who are likely to like it, um, not recommend it to the people who are likely to not like it. Um, and having more data around those scripts is valuable for us. So we want to make it uh, as, as inexpensive for you as we possibly can without going into debt ourselves um, to get that additional rating so that we can identify folks who may like your work. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any difference in the average ratings of agents and managers versus the paid readers? On average, I think I looked at this maybe a couple of months ago, the, the rating of industry professionals tends to run on average about 0.5 points higher than the ratings of our readers. Um, I think there's a number of factors behind that. The most significant one is that I don't think most industry professionals are going online to rate people's scripts negatively. There's no real upside for, to them in doing that, um, except for just improving the data that we have so we can make better recommendations for them. But I think by and large, you know, if I'm an industry professional and I read a script and I'm not into it and I stop reading after 30 pages, it's highly unlikely that I'm going to go online and rate the script negatively. But I may, if I read a script and love it, go rate it positively to bring more attention to the script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of my thought, and that's why I, I, as an experiment, I put this, put the link to my script. And as I said, I did get um, six downloads from that. Do you know? Do you have a percentage of like how many downloads? Um, how many? Wh what percentage of the of the agents and managers come back and actually rate the scripts that they've actually yeah. done? Right now, it looks like it's about one in seven. Um, okay, I, I got seven. So <laughs> downloads, um, but no, it's, it's it's about it's about fourteen, fifteen percent. Um, I see. You know, we we wanted we do want to find ways to incentivize uh, industry pros to rate the scripts they've downloaded and read. The challenge there, though, is that we what we don't want to incentivize people rating scripts they haven't read. Um, and so we haven't quite been able to square that circle yet. 
But I, again, I think it's, it's, it's more important to me that the ratings that are given reflect people's actual opinions about material than that we have a high volume of, ra of ratings. If we can find a way to have both, then obviously we'll be much happier. But in the meantime, until we figure out how to do that, we're going to leave people to rate scripts that they've actually read and not, and not sort of force them or even incentivize them. Um, we, we just don't want to create an incentive structure that encourages behavior that has less than ideal integrity. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I think that kind of just that was my list of questions. Are there any questions that maybe you think I should have asked but didn't? Is there anything else you want to say about the um, the blacklist site? Yeah, I think that the, the, the things, some of the things that, that I, I would just highlight, you know, we, in addition to the, well, I think there's, there's a few things. The first is, is that I think that, you know, and I think this will probably be inevitable given that your podcast is called Selling Your Screenplay, but I think people sort of look at us first and foremost um, as a business that if you submit your script, we're going to sell your script. And that's not who we are. Uh, we make no guarantees or no promises along those lines. And in fact, we're very transparent about the fact that the odds are long, um, even within the context of our site. Um, however, you know, I think it's important to remember, too, that what we do provide is uh, fast, high quality, direct feedback on your script, regardless of what stage you are in your career. Um, I don't know anywhere else where for 50 to 75 dollars, uh, you can get um, someone who has worked recently in the industry at a very high level, um, you know, at an, as, as an employed reader for a major agency or management company at a minimum uh, to read your entire screenplay and give you feedback about what they think about it. Um, we've done over 15,000 script evaluations, which I think is a, a pretty remarkable number. And our complaint rate is, is about 1.5% within those 15,000, which is really remarkable, I think, because people are justifiably sensitive about their own, their work, their artistic work. Sure. Um, you know, we have partnerships with the Writers Guild East, the Writers Guild West, um, the Writers Guild of Great Britain, um, that allows all of their members, if you're a member of one of the guilds, you can list your scripts in our database and we can drive incoming phone calls to your agents about your back catalog. And there is literally no downside because you're able to hide any, any information that you don't want to make public about those scripts. Um, so I highly encourage anyone who's a member of the guild to, to list their scripts as part of our database as, as soon as they can. Um, and then we have partnerships with you know, a large number of studios and television networks now. You know, we're partnered with Warner Brothers Pictures. Um, Three more times over the next 18 months, we'll send them a short list of 10 writers um, for consideration for a two-step guild minimum blind deal, one of which was awarded via this process in mid-December. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Disney to help identify uh, writers with diverse perspectives for their uh, residency feature writers program. Uh, we have a partnership with TNT and TBS to identify a writer of drama and a writer of comedy um, for a blind deal um, at both of those networks. Um, and the four writers who are not chosen for each of those opportunities from the short list, will be, their work will be circulated to um, all of their active showrunners for staffing consideration. Um, we have a partnership with the YouTube channel Wigs, which was started by Rodrigo Garcia and John and Jake Abnett, um, to identify a writer for a blind deal to write um, a pilot for a new series on, on their uh, YouTube channel. Um, we have a partnership with the Hasty Pudding Institute um, of 1770, which is the third oldest theatrical organization in the world that has put up $20,000 for a writer of satire or uh, significant social commentary that will be judged by, among others, Helen Estabrook, uh, who produced uh, Whiplash, which is a former blacklist script that won the jury prize and critics prize at this year's Sundance. Um, partnered with the Sundance Institute to identify writers for their labs. Um, I think I'm missing one, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. <laughs> That's a and lot of partnerships. a lot, and, we, and we've got more coming, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, stay, uh, continue to be tuned in and you'll be excited about it. But um, and then we have also last year in October, we did our first screenwriters lab. You know, we invited six writers who had never made more than twenty five thousand dollars out to downtown Las Vegas, hosted by Tony Shea and the downtown Las Vegas project. And Billy Ray, um, you know, who wrote Captain Phillips, Kiwi Smith, who wrote Legally Blonde, Jenny Lamette, who wrote Rachel Getting Married and Brian Koppelman, who wrote Rounders. Um, you know, came out and, 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 and were mentors along with Scott Myers, who was our, our official blogger um, for going to the story. Um, and, you know, they were all expenses paid for a week and, and had an experience that I think I feel reasonably safe in saying sort of changed the trajectory of their professional screenwriting careers. And we, I'm pleased to announce that we will definitely be doing that again this year, again in downtown Las Vegas, probably the first week of October. 
Um, and then lastly, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of free stuff available on the site that doesn't require uh, giving us any money at all. Scott Myers, who does our official screenwriting blog, go into the story is um, I really don't know how he manages to generate that much. Yeah, content. he's a he's a uh, blogging animal. <laughs> yeah, I really, like I'm convinced he has some sort of time stopping machine in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where it allows him to generate you know work at that level and that frequency. But, you know, if you're trying to educate yourself about how to be a screenwriter, how to be a better screenwriter, there's really no better place to look than his blog. Um, we launched uh, the Blackboard, which is an online community uh, moderated by Shala Evans, um, which is a great, positive community where you can get guidance and help and meet other screenwriters online. Um, you know, we're very active on social media, um, uh, both in Twitter and Facebook. And, um, you know, we... Uh, we want to hear from you. Uh, we, we pride ourselves on our customer service. We pride ourselves um, on the way in which we do business. And, um, and, and yeah, I think that's the long is, rambling. This is the, the further stuff that we do. Mm -hmm. Are you on Twitter? Is there a way for people to um, just if they want to connect with you, follow you, um, learn more about you? Is there a good way for people to do that? Yeah, the, um, the blacklist on Twitter is at the B-L-C-K-L-S-T. Um, okay. And, I'll uh, link. I'll link to all this in the show yeah, notes. I'll put some yeah, show notes actually uh, links to it. You know, the, the, the blacklist being a you know a relatively conventional idiomatic expression uh, makes it difficult oftentimes to claim the very simple spelling of all of these things. So we sort of adopted blacklist with no vowels as our personal brand, and we add you know the in front of it for the purposes of Twitter. Um, I'm also on Twitter at Franklin Leonard, um, but you don't you won't get much movie or screenwriting stuff from me there. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, but we're, we're definitely around. Perfect. Easily perfect. findable. We're also not at NBC, the blacklist, which is the television show. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Um, so great, Franklin, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. You've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, no, totally my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I get quite a few emails every week from people who are looking for professional notes on their screenplay. I don't cur currently offer this as a service, but I do work with several other excellent writers and producers who will give you professional notes. So if you're looking for notes on a script that you're working on, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. In this week's writing words section, I wanted to touch on a few things that Franklin talked about. It should be really, really clear in all of this that rejection is part of the game. Just because your screenplay doesn't work on the blacklist doesn't mean you should stop trying to market it. As I mentioned in the interview, I've uploaded four scripts and they've all received pretty mediocre scores. That doesn't even remotely deter me. Of the score, four scripts I posted on the site, I've optioned three of them. So just because they don't work on the blacklist doesn't mean there isn't a market for them somewhere else. The one script that I've never optioned, I actually just finished about a month ago so who knows I might end up optioning that one too at some point in my case um, I optioned the three scripts that I did optioned I optioned them using my own email and fax blast service but you as a writer have got to find a marketing channel that works for you this might be it but you really won't know until you try it I never did very well in contests and I sort of feel like this has the same vibe where there is a premium put on sort of more you know literary scripts as opposed to more commercial fare, but who knows, that's probably a bigger topic for another day. As another example, a script I sold a couple of years ago that was produced last year called Rush Lights, that was actually one of the, my early scripts, and I entered it into a bunch of contests many, many years ago, including the Nicole Fellowship, and which is considered the best screenwriting contest out there. They didn't like it, and in fact, none of the contests like it because it didn't place in any contest, but yet I was able to eventually sell it, and it did eventually get produced. So again, the key is to never get discouraged by the rejection. That's all part of the process. In any event, I'm a little skeptical that I'll ever do very well on this blacklist site, but I'll probably keep trying it out with a few more scripts. I'm definitely going to upload my most recent spec, a low-budget horror thriller script that I'm finishing up now, so we'll see how that goes. But the bottom line is you should try these various services and see what you're getting, see where you're getting traction. You might find that you have good luck with the blacklist, and if you do, keep uploading more of your scripts and see if you can find a match. Again, the only way you're really going to know what works for you is by trying a bunch of different things. Anyways, that's our show. Thanks for listening.